blame someone else. I don't know what to do. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about video game modding. Um, a lot of us, unfortunately, I'm starting to feel like I'm one of the old people in game development now. Um, I've been doing it for over 15 years on and off, and I got started like a lot of other people got started through modding. And I had a conversation a while ago with a friend who wanted to talk about his experience modding for Halo. And we said, well, why don't people mod anymore? I said, dude, they do. Can you still get into the games industry by doing that? Yes. Um, modding is traditionally seen as the tried and true entrance to game development. And I want to talk a little bit about the history of modding and why I still think it's relevant. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is, but I have a lot of weird thoughts. I more or less stole this from my friend Neil. He wanted to do a similar talk or panel. Um, so I just wanted to give him credit where that's due. Um, <clears throat> but about me, I'm Seth Manti. I'm from Boston, like a lot of us. Um, I started in video games in about 2002, doing modding for Unreal Tournament, the original. Um, I did a lot of map making. We did system improvements. We ended up creating an add-on to the game. It was probably one of the best mods that's ever been made, in my opinion. Um, I did anti-cheat some of the best anti-cheat ever because back then you had to do anti-cheat externally. The companies didn't provide it themselves. Um, and I interfaced a lot of servers and did a bunch of different stuff via IRC, which for those of us that are older might still remember what that is. It's like Discord, but more fun. Um, so through that, eventually I started a relationship with Epic Games. Um, and then they approached me and they said, hey, start this community in Boston. So I did. Um, and over the years, I've worked on all sorts of large, small games, and I've done a little bit of everything. I've done really bad programming, terrible translations. Um, I've done some QAing, designing, business development, PR, marketing, more developing, and so on and so forth. I like to wear a lot of different hats, none of them very well. So back in the day, back in the 90s and early 2000s, modding was the tried and true way to get into the game development industry. If you wanted to go and apply to work at a game development company, you had no way of getting experience other than modding, essentially. Um, but now that's sort of gone down. There was sort of a decline of PC games in the mid-2000s when piracy went up. <clears throat> and they stopped making games that could be moddable. Eventually, the free-to-play engines came out in the early 2010s, and those engines have made it possible for people to make games from scratch. And so modding has really left the conversation. I still think, as I said before, it's the best way to get into game development right now. So first and foremost, we should talk about what modding is. So it's the practice of adding, removing, tweaking, changing, manipulating a game um, from its originally presented form. It's typically done using tools provided by the developers or created by the communities after reverse engineering a game's code. Modding includes map making, reskinning, re-implementation of changes to the audio, revamp of in-game systems, user experience improvements, new utilities, anti-cheat, and cheats. I'd like to argue that cheats are a mod. Uh, and then total conversion mods as well, which is where you take a game and you completely convert it into essentially a new game. Uh, so modding began sort of taking hold in the 1980s. Uh, there was a great game called Castle Smurfenstein, which probably had the most annoying startup music of all time. Uh, Wolfenstein's enemies were replaced by Smurfs. And for some reason, someone had, I think he was based out in Utah, he had this irrational hatred of Smurfs, like no one has ever had before. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the developers of Doom, uh, same developers of Wolfenstein, played this and they saw, and they en ended up releasing modding tools for Doom in 1993. Those were some of the first modding tools ever created, and they did it again for Quake. Capture the Flag was actually invented via modding for Quake, um, and then as modding's prevalence sort of grew, game studios found that they could actually find talented developers from there, which is pretty cool. Um, the game's developers, or the game's modders, knew their games to the core. It's really, really convenient. So if you're searching for someone to join your team, why not pick someone that already knows your game? Um, 
modding also boosts the longevity of games as well. So it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, and modders also developed fan bases that were able to transition into standalone titles. The guys who did uh, DayZ started off with that, for example. Uh, the late 90s, I would consider to be sort of the golden age of modding. Uh, as I said earlier, PC titles eventually sort of fell off, which was a shame. Um, and I was speaking actually with my friend Joe a couple weeks ago, and he said, well, is modding still a thing? And you mentioned a couple games, but yeah. there's some that are really huge now. Um, so the early 2010s, you had the Elder Scrolls games, Team Fortress 2, Left 4 Dead got modded like crazy, Grand Theft Auto 5, and many, many more. So what I'm trying to say right now is that we've come a long way. These are a couple games that started off with uh, mods and eventually became total conversion mods. So Tactical Ops was sold in store shelves in the early 2000s. That was a mod of Unreal Tournament originally. Team Fortress spawned out of Quake. Counter-Strike spawned off of Half-Life. Then there was also Gary's mod. The game Chivalry, the uh, sword fighting game, was actually a Half-Life 2 conversion. Uh, Killing Floor, Dota started off in StarCraft and then got transferred to Warcraft. DayZ, PUBG, Dear Esther, and The Stand of Parable. So these are games that have sold tremendously well on their own. But they all started off via modding. You good? All right. Um, so we still have a lot of games right now that are actively modded. And maybe we don't see the, these mods as often, but they're still out there. Uh, Skyrim is still incredibly actively modded. Left 4 Dead 2, TF2, Minecraft is the, the largest modded game of all time. Grand Theft Auto 5, Robo Recall, and Star Wars Galaxies. But what's the point of all of that, right? I think and I would argue that modding makes games better. Most game developers are bad at games. Is that fair to say? It's, it's pretty true, unfortunately. You don't have time to play games when you're making them. So good game design and concept is not always equal to, or theory, which is what a lot of game developers have, is not always equal to experience. You can work on your game in the engine, you can play it in the office for years and it might still not be equal to the experience that someone has playing the game as a fan for a year. So modders have the unique experience of actually playing and engaging the games that they're modding, and developers don't have that luxury. Modders are able to build off their experiences and the experience of the communities to make quality of life improvements to games that might go overlooked by the game developers themselves. But most importantly, I think that modding offers a really good opportunity to learn game development. So games that support modding basically provide a very structured environment within which to learn game development. Uh, there's essentially a playground. You can't break anything. <coughs> um, but you're always going to stay sort of playing within that sandbox. There are clear goals, less feature creep, and overall less to manage. If you're changing the way certain elements of a game works, maybe you don't need to worry about the audio, sound, or UX design. There's tons of opportunities for learning. There's exploration, expansion, collaboration with other people, just like in normal game development. Uh, and they provide space and focus, uh, or to focus purely on specific elements of a game development. Maybe you're a level designer, and all you want to focus on is level design, maybe environmental art. That's perfectly fine. You don't need to worry about the systems. You don't need to worry about movement, any other improvement other than the level design itself. If you want to break the game, learn about cheats. I think that's a great way to learn, unfortunately. I don't advocate for it because I think it would be breaking a lot of people's terms of service, and I don't want you to get in trouble, but it's great. Uh, you can redo art and music. You may say, you know, this game has great music, but maybe we can jazz it up a little bit. Do it. Reverse engineer modding tools. Learn how the game was built. But modding is also very versatile. If you're modding a game in the Source Engine, it's similar to modding the next. You can do Left 4 Dead, Counter-Strike, pretty much the same stuff. If you mod using Unreal Engine's blueprints, you can mod the next game using them. You can mod Arc, you can mod Robo Recall. You can mod Unreal Tournament. It's easy as that. 
And, you know, it might not really sound that easy, but yeah, no, it really is that easy. Um, the skills you learn, though, are very, very transferable. Good level design is going to be good level design. Good gameplay is always going to be good at gameplay. And good art, well, that's a matter of opinion. But modding is also <clears throat> one of the coolest ways to be, build community. Um, game modding spawned communities back in the 90s and early 2000s, which were some of the most interesting, uplifting, and positive spaces in one of the most toxic eras of video games. Um, those communities were always really difficult to find. You might release something and then find out through someone else that there's a completely different, larger community that you could be a part of to release these mods to. Um, in fact, I believe Joe and I spoke about that a while back. Uh, <clears throat> I started off releasing these mods in a very small community in Unreal Tournament, and then I found out there was actually a much larger community. And everything those people had to say was positive. We went from this really toxic space to the most positive space where they could not only give you good feedback, but they could give you suggestions and tell you what you're doing and tell you how to make improvements. So the learning was there and the learning happened within you know, two or three days of people responding to your forum posts. It was great. So they provide this great feedback loop from other professionals that know what they're doing. Uh, like I said, they're super helpful. They have the technical know-how and they produce their own how-to documentations. I learned just about everything I ever wanted to know from um, an HTML database called Curag. It was the complete Unreal Editor's resource and guide. And it gave all these little simple instructions on how to do the most basic things in games. And there are similar files out there all the time. The documentation lets you teach yourself, and you can get started from there. But modders also follow and support other modders. You can still build a community as a modder. Uh, Player Unknown, for example, has a name that people recognize because he was modding Arma 3. Modding is also a way to make money, though. Uh, so Steam opened paid mods in the paid workshop in 2015. Epic and Unity offer ways to have mods uh, for sale on their marketplaces as well. Um, this is a little bit controversial, but I think by now most of the controversies uh, passed. People have said modding should be only a hobby, but you can make money off of it. If you're producing really, really good work, maybe you should get paid for it. Um, but, you know, if you're modding Skyrim in 2018, it still had a million monthly active users, which is maybe a lot more than I'm going to get if I release an indie game today. We'll talk about that later. But a 299 mod sold to 5,000 people is going to do a lot better than the average game does in 2019. Speaking only from averages. Um, and then you got to look at, too, you got to look at the effort to dollars ratio, too. So if you're not starting from scratch and you're just modding and you release something for 99 cents, maybe your effort isn't really going to be through the roof like it might be if you're doing everything from scratch. Um, so then. I wanted to talk a little bit about understanding the current game market, because I think the current game market in mods is really the key to why I think it could be very relevant today. So we all know Steam has become uh, sort of the wild, wild west. We're living in the wild, wild west of Steam today. Um, there are more games released on Steam now than like ever before, obviously. I don't even know how to really compare it, but uh, there's 27,000 games on Steam at the end of 2018. Um, that's almost as many people as go to Harvard. It's just, it's an unfathomable number at this point. And 2019 is going to probably see over 10,000 games released on Steam. So you're looking at 30 plus games released, or uh, a day. Um, or 100 plus games released per day. Who's going to do the math? I don't know. Um, but... When we release games, we're not just competing about against the you know, 25, 30 games released that day, um, 175 plus per week, 2,500 per month. Um, we're competing against the games that are already available. So people are still buying Half-Life, the original, from 1996. Um, there's 30,000 titles on Steam that we're still competing with. So on average, you have a 1 in 7,359 chance of selling just 100 copies. Maybe if I'm modding to a game like Counter-Strike um, with, you know, 10 million users, 
I might have a larger audience. So I do think modding is really sort of the road less traveled. Um, and you should take that road less traveled, not because it's going to be more difficult, but because there's less traffic. Anyone who drives in Boston understands this. Um, there's a reason why I don't want to drive on 93 every day. <clears throat> so perhaps releasing our games onto Steam as an independent title is not the way we should be going. Um, maybe we should start thinking about modding, doing add-ons, getting involved in these communities that already exist. It's just as valuable as a tool. It offers a way to get ahead, own our skills, without constantly fighting that sort of uphill battle of getting recognized. You don't need to do as much marketing. And consequently, you're going to save a ton of money on that. Uh, game development companies can judge work that modders have done very easily, and sometimes more favorably than just, say, a college degree. Game development degrees are great. Most of those programs provide a degree of experience, but they're a game development degree at Becker College or Full Sail is not the same as a game development degree at the now defunct Mount Ida University or something like that. There are some programs that don't have it going on, but if you're modding, people can see what you've done. Uh, and then lastly, the experience counts. The experience you get from math modding matters. The sort of millennial conundrum that we all have right now is the entry level jobs trying to pay you $20,000 a year still want 10 years of experience. It's bullshit. Um, <clears throat> I think we sort of as a game development community need to take modding a lot more seriously, not just because it sort of helps address the problem that we're dealing with of oversaturation in the market, uh, but modding takes serious effort. It takes serious talent to be able to do this stuff. You're still doing game development while you're doing modding. Good mods and good games aren't created by unskilled people. You just can't have that happen. Um, and so with that, I'd like to welcome some thoughts and feedback. Do you guys think that this concept of modding being something we should start reconsidering, refocusing on is worth it? Does that make sense? Is there a case for that? Am I full of shit? You can tell me if I am. Not you, Forrest. I can say you're full of shit, but not like disagree I mean, you with this particular point. You do <laughs> often. Because they're not usually exclusive ideas. In the back. So that's, it was such one of those things I would never have experienced if that mod didn't exist. That's amazing. So you're, you're talking right there about adding to the longevity of the game. And the Bethesda titles have been wonderful for allowing modding to happen as well. Um, but that's, that's a wonderful point right there. Yeah. Um, I like to play Sims. Okay. And I'm, I'm always amazed. So I think my favorite mod ever was one of the ones that I worked on, so I can't include that. But my favorite uh, modding set is the Legend of Zelda mods for Left 4 Dead 2, where they redid almost all of Ocarina of Time in Left 4 Dead 2. But the level of detail that they put in is insane. Um, they allowed it so you could get like the, the Hylian shield, and you could walk through some of the temples that they had built and it was so realistic, updated graphics from the N64, but they did it perfectly. But they put a ton of work into it to do that. And it's really beautiful to see. Yeah. What level of modding do you think is necessary for a game to have in order to build up a healthy ecosystem around the content the community creates for it? That is such an open-ended question. I'd rather not answer it. <laughs> no, so that, that depends on the game, right? So there are some games out there that are as released 
they're wonderful. You wouldn't want to make many additions unless you really just want to dig around. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe even ruin what people have done. So some of these games, you know, Skyrim is one of the most modded games. And some of the things that they've done in that is they made it so um, all the dragons in that would be Macho Man Randy Savage from the WWE. Or Thomas the Tank Engine. Yes. And that's absolutely ridiculous. I have no idea why someone would want to do that. But then you see it and you're like, I'm glad that they did that. You get a good laugh out of it. Um, I don't know. I think that that would really depend per game. And I think the modding community is very good about figuring that out. Um, they understand where they take that stuff too far. So um, Rockstar Games, for example, used to be very pro-modding. And then after San Andreas, there was a, a mod called Hot Coffee where they allowed uh, inappropriate level of graphic content. And Rockstar then said with GTA V, we're not letting you guys mod anymore. It's actually in their terms of service that you're not allowed to mod the game. But internally, everyone at Rockstar is like, no, this is cool. We're never going to enforce this unless Hot Coffee 2 happens. Um, and the modding community there just in general is like, yeah, we're not going to push those boundaries anymore. So I, I really do think it's self-regulating on some level. I don't think there's a right amount. I don't think I could just go in and say every game needs 100 modders on it. Does that make sense? Does that answer your mm -hmm. question? All right. Joe? Um, so early on in the talk, you were talking about various things that are still being modded actively now. And there was one game that stuck out. Kind of strange to me on Star Wars Galaxies, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so Star Wars cool. Galaxies has the most fascinating mod experience of all time. Okay. It still has about 5,000 active users, but this game was made in 2001. It was canceled, wasn't it? They shut it down. Okay. And they shut it down after just a couple of years. And people said, okay, uh, we want the source code. So they took the source code. I think they were given it, but who knows? <laughs> they got the source code. And they started up servers, and they said, we're going to go back to the original. But then we're going to make all sorts of quality improvements. So now we're going to allow ourselves to run dedicated servers ourselves. We're going to improve the UI. We're going to improve the graphics to some level. We're going to improve the gameplay. And they did this. It's been a literal project. They've had you know, a team more or less working around the clock monthly for 12 plus years at this point, keeping this game alive for 5,000 people. How has that gotten through, well, I guess you wouldn't know, but like, how has that gotten through uh, uh, Special Life Magic at all? How is Lucas not yeah. stamping down? How is Disney not stamping down? I don't know. I mean, it's 5,000 yeah. people. Do they still know? It's, uh, if they're watching, tell them not to shut that down. <laughs> um, I mean, the games they've released lately have been so far out of line with what some members of the community want. That the fact that this is happening and there are still people out there designing an old game the way that they want it to be, maybe they should pay attention and learn a thing or two. Oh, no, there. It was just kind of yeah. strange. Uh, I don't want to list. I was like, huh. Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that because I did want to talk about that. Cool stuff. Yeah, Star Wars Galaxy is an absolute triumph of modern at this point. Les? So, uh, yeah, I think, I think modding is, is a really good thing for your portfolio. Because uh, uh, especially if you target it toward a certain company, <clears throat> like if you want to get a job with a certain company and they've got a nice game that you can mod, that's a great thing to have in your portfolio when, when you do that. It's, uh, and it's the kind of thing where, uh, sure, the best thing is to get Unity, get Unreal, build your own game from scratch. That shows a variety of skills and, and, and everything. But you're not going to get that, especially for a AAA company, you're not going to get, you won't be able to use their assets, you won't be able to make it as finished as doing a mod with all the full assets that, that a finished game get, gives you. Especially if you're doing, concentrating on like level design and things like that. So it's definitely, it's definitely a good thing, uh, a good thing to do. When I look to hire people though, I don't want to hire someone that has done everything or that can do everything. I want to hire someone that, if you're a good level designer, I want you to focus on level design. I don't want you coming to me saying, hey, I can do these programming tasks. I want you focused on what you know how to do. And I think modding allows for that focus as well. Um, obviously, I think it's good to learn as much as you possibly can, but I think focus <coughs> is, is really helpful. One question in the back. Um, how you mentioned like, PUBG and Arma. At what point do you think, like, do you think there is a point where a modder is taking a game 
and almost reskinning it, where like play around with how to or monster as it's mod and build this mod until it could be a standalone game. Yeah. Do you think there's a point where modders can say like, okay, I need to take a step back because now I'm just using someone else's work as my own skeleton and not and like almost benefiting without paying back to that person? Yeah, I, I think that there are legal implications there. However, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I would rather not answer that and implicate myself. Now, um, I'm not sure when the transition happened with that, because PUBG is a standalone game. Yeah. Uh, Player Unknown had done a lot of modding for Arma 3. Um, but PUBG is a standalone game. It's built in Unreal, whereas Arma was built in, uh, were they using uh, the Frost engine for that? Does anyone know? Okay. They might have had their own thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, so, so I think it's a, a bit of a different, uh, a different, unique um, situation, game by game, okay. as everything is. Uh, but I would advise, if you do plan on doing a total conversion mod, you might want to reach out to them first, see what's in their end user license agreement, and talk to a lawyer. Okay. All right, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you guys listening to me around.